This is my school and this is my learning zone. I'm Pranjo, a full-time high school student. In my free time, I find the opportunities to have conversations with professionals from various walks of life. Over time, I have learned that you have to be humble, work hard, and be a lifelong learner to be successful in life. I invite you to join me in one such journey. I hope you enjoy it. Today, I am privileged to interview a person for whom I have the utmost respect. When I started this series, it was my dream to interview him one day. He is the head of my school and he has been involved in international education since 1995. He started out as a high school social studies teacher, then became a principal, and now for the past 17 years has been the head of school at Dalat International School, Penang, Malaysia. Please welcome Mr. Steinkamp. It's awesome. Thanks for interviewing me. It'd be fun. So Mr. Steinkamp, let's start at the very beginning. When you were in school, were you more inclined to a activities in sports or studying? studying? I definitely trended towards more being involved in athletics. I uh, actually got to grow up, I went to school in Australia uh, and in the public schools in the States before I came to Dalat. Um, so I played sports like rugby, Australian rules football, cricket, uh, basketball, soccer. So I was definitely into sports. Academics wasn't wasn't too important. Um, in fact, when I was in high school, kind of the main reason I was academically inclined was to make sure I could still qualify to play sports because schools have to have, you have to have a certain GPA, yeah. that kind of thing. So I got more inclined towards learning or wanting to learn actually when I got into university. So you changed towards being more studious in university. How would you over describe the overall experience of your early schooling? Well, my education was pretty messed up. Uh, so uh, over my 12 years of schooling, K to 12, mm -hmm. I was at Dalat for first grade. Right. And then I was in Australia for uh, part of first grade. Second, I did second and third grade in one year. Uh, and then I did half of fourth grade. But then when I went back to the U.S., the Australian system and the American system, the American system starts in August, like yeah. here at Dalat, yeah. but Australia starts in January, right? right? So I did a half a year of fourth grade. So when I went back to the U.S., I did another year of fourth. Oh, yeah. Then I did fifth grade. Then we moved back to Australia again. So I skipped ahead and only did a half a year of sixth. I did seventh grade. And then I did half a year of eighth, and then we went back to the States, so I did another year of eighth. And then I did ninth, tenth, eleventh, and then I came to Dalat for my senior year. What prompted you to move from the America back to Australia? That was my forward? parents. My yeah. parents worked in Australia for a couple of years, and they went back to the States, the U.S., and I was went to public school there, and then they went back to Australia, right. they went back, so... It is what it is. Okay. It's still fun. So you complete your senior year at Dalat. Yeah. At that point, did you know where you wanted to study? You know what? I did not. I did not know what I wanted to do. Um, my parents wanted me to go to university uh, just because a lot of parents want mm, you know, university. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, I decided I would go for my first year. But the first year I was there, I really decided I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I actually convinced my two roommates to drop out of college. Oh, wow. Yeah, my parents were too sick. So, <laughs> so we dropped out and we worked for a year and raised money. I saved a whole bunch of money, and then we traveled for about 10 to 12 months, just around the world. Went to Europe, oh, wow. Africa, Southeast Asia, Australia. And then when I came back after that year and a half, I knew that I wanted to, I, I, because of things that I had done during that trip, I knew I wanted to be a teacher. So then I went back with a purpose, right? So I've told a lot of students this. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a gap year. In fact, a gap year can be great because it gives you a chance to be independent, kind of go out and experience the world and figure out a little bit before. Because my grades before and after my gap year, I went from a eh, B, C student to uh, the last three years of university, I was straight A's because wow. I care. I cared yeah. about what I was doing. I wanted to become a teacher. I knew where I wanted to go, but that didn't happen until I kind of dropped out of school for a little while. So going back to what you said, how did you convince your roommates to drop out with you? It seems like a <laughs> well, big task. Well, there was a really big map in our room, in our dorm room, 
And one afternoon, I just started talking about places that I had lived or grown up. And I said, and then I said, you know what would be fun is we should do a trip together. Mm. And so as we were talking about a trip, then we started planning about, well, we got to do the, you know, we got to do the Great Wall of China. We need to see, you know, the pyramids. And, all that. and so then we kind of planned out a trip yeah. around the world. And then about an hour or so later, after we planned it all out, I just kind of looked at him and said, why don't we go do this trip? Why, why, what's stopping us? You know, right. none of us had girlfriends at the time. <laughs> We didn't really know what we wanted to do for you know career, so I convinced them to um, I convinced them to drop out. It was awesome. I mean, we worked together for a year and a half, and then we traveled around the world. So, how did you learn that you wanted to be a teacher out of this experience? Well, okay. So uh, when I was going around the world, mm -hmm. I purposely came back to Malaysia where I went to school. Right, yeah. I graduated from Dalat, so I came back here and. At the time, uh, the head of school, mm -hmm. um, actually, Mr. Penland's father. Oh, yeah. Wow. So his dad was the head of school when I was doing my trip, and I kind of landed here to see friends for about two weeks. Mm. And at the end of the two weeks, I walked into his office and I said, "I have nowhere to go. I don't have to be anywhere. If you give me a place to stay, I'll work for free." Right. Right. And so he said, "Sure. I mean, free labor, right?" <laughs> So uh, I lived with one of the single teachers, and then I worked at Dalat for about three months. And so I did. I worked with Roger, with the facilities guys. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the library. I worked in the cafeteria. Um, and one of the things that I got to do was actually be in the classroom and help some of the teachers. Right. And while I was doing that, I realized that I think I would. I wanted to become a teacher. And so that's. So then I. After leaving the lot, then I knew when I headed back, I would go into education. So you finish your trip, you know yep. that you want to become a teacher, and then you go back to college. Yeah. You went back to the same college you dropped out of? I did. Okay. I did, actually. I had a couple of friends there, and I knew a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the community I knew, so I went back there, mm -hmm. and then did my sophomore, junior, and senior year. So every, every student in high school, they have a stereotypical view of college or university. They imagine what it's going to be like. Were your experiences similar to your university days? Well, okay, so one of the things that's cool about Dalat, so when I was here, I came and actually lived in the dorms, mm -hmm. right? So I was a dorm student and graduated. And honestly, coming and being a dorm student at Dalat is sort of similar to university because you leave your parents, you right. live with somebody else. Uh, you're in a dorm. So that wasn't really new. What was probably most, probably the biggest different th difference that you'll experience is that you go from being at school all the time to university, you just go for your classes. Mm, yeah. You have a lot more free time. Yes. So then the big question is, do you have enough self-discipline over yourself yes, yes. that when you don't have your parents or your teachers telling you you have to do something, mm -hmm. that you still go to classes, you still do your homework? Uh, that's a big that's a big part of doing university. But you have so much more free time. Yeah. So it's awesome. This brings me to my next question. How did you handle this free time? Did you have any hobbies or what did you do with your free time? Well, actually, I played. one of the reasons I went to the university I went to was because they the sports program. Mm. I liked their sports program. And it was a small enough school that I could play on their varsity sports. Right, so I right. played varsity soccer. I played varsity basketball for a couple of years. And then I played uh, varsity volleyball. Um, so that took up a lot of my free time because I practiced it yeah. as we traveled for games. Um, so that took up a lot of my free time. Let's see, what else did I, I... I mean, part of the free time was just the ability to determine... Oh, well, actually, another big part of my free time was work. Yes. You know, when you're in college, university, a lot of times you have to work to, so you can have some spending money. So I worked at Pizza Hut, I worked at some restaurants, I worked at a cleaning company. So that, I wouldn't call that a hobby, but that took up some of my free time. So. How was your overall experience of your university days? Oh, I loved it. Yeah, I mean, university was fun because you're still, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good transition to adulthood because you still, you have some independence. Uh, you're, you're not living with your parents anymore. You get to decide, mm -hmm. you know, am I gonna go to bed now or am I gonna stay up and keep playing Halo for another five <laughs> hours? Uh, that kind of stuff. So there is some independence, but you're not totally, you know, you got a dorm, usually there's a cafeteria, mm -hmm. so you don't have to necessarily worry about feeding yourself. 
Uh, you got an instant community of friends. You're doing kind of fun stuff together with your friends. So it's a great transition to, you know, moving on into your career in adulthood. So yeah, I think university was awesome. Did you face any setbacks in university along with your best memories? Um, no, I mean, I made that choice to, you know, in the end, university took me five and a half years to graduate, yeah. right, instead of the normal four. I mean, I wouldn't call it a setback. It slowed me down, but it actually was way better. I, I, you know, I like that I did that. Um, no, I, didn't, I mean, once I got there and I knew I wanted to teach, then I was able to finish in three years. Nothing stopped me, nothing, uh, nothing dramatic in that sense. So after finishing university, what degree did you get? Well, I ended up with a degree in history, social mm -hmm. studies, so I could teach. Uh, I could teach in the social studies area, but I also got a coaching certificate, coaching yeah. degree. Um, so then, actually, right out of university, so I, I met my wife, uh, Mrs. Steinkamp, who works in the counseling yeah. department here at school. Um, so we dated in college, and we got married right as we finished mm -hmm. university. Well, she wanted to get her master's in counseling. Yeah. And so uh, initially that meant that as soon as we were done with university, she needed to get into a master's program. Mm -hmm. So it kind of became the focus of getting her through school. So then I just worked odd jobs um, and really didn't get a teaching job. Yeah. Um, so that's what led to then, once she got her degree, then actually my first job official first teaching job was back here at Delot. Oh, wow. Because an opening came in the history department, okay. and I knew some people, and they knew me, and, I, uh, and so they, you know, I did the application, and so they hired me. So uh, it took about three years from the time I graduated from university to the point where I was teaching. In between, I just did a bunch of odd jobs. Going back to what you said, you got your degree in history. Yep. What made you choose? Did you have a choice to choose your degree? Or what made history yeah, come out of the top? Well, to me, and this is nothing against math and science, just history is more fun to teach. Right. Right? Uh, no, actually, science looks like it's a lot of fun to teach. I couldn't, I really didn't get into math growing up, mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't one of my favorite subjects. So uh, when I was looking at saying I wanted to get into education and teach, to me, I think, this is just my opinion, history is the best place yeah. to be because you get to talk about what happened you get to you know understand history um, it's a fun thing to teach you can be really creative in your teaching and all that so it just I just kind of gravitated towards history so after finishing university in five and a half years you, you know, go on to your first job not first job not because you were teaching, working right? but you became a Nordic training Nordic, yeah. yeah what what was the job well okay so at university there uh, Nordic Track, which is a fitness company in the United mm -hmm. States. In fact, they're most famous for uh, building and creating or designing a one of the first uh, cross-country snow cross-country ski oh, machines. Wow. So it fake it. You're not actually outside. You're inside. But but yeah. it's the same action and it, and they and so it, it became a really large company. Well, it was really close to the university I worked at. Mm. So you could get a job there very easily because they needed people to be on the phones, taking sales, yeah, yeah. customer service. So actually, towards the end of my university, I worked there just on the sales floor. But then once I was done with my degree and I could work there not just part-time, they had an opening in what was called a training specialist, mm. which basically a training specialist is just a teacher in the business oh, world. Yeah. So I would train people on, uh, I would train the new staff on how to sell, I would train the new staff on the equipment, um, we would design teaching for uh, leadership training for the middle management. Mm -hmm. And so even though it wasn't actually a teaching degree, it gave me a chance to actually uh, get better and learn and, and do actually teaching but just in the business world. So it was awesome. I love my job. Was it a big transition moving from studying to working full time? Uh, not too bad, again, because I worked so much in college yeah. and all of that, and I actually worked there before I was done with my degree. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was a little bit. I mean, there's a lot of transition when you come out of university. One, you know, you got to get an apartment, you got to make yeah. your own meals, you, you know. 
there's just all the things of adulting, right? yeah, learning yeah. to be an adult. So I'm sure that was part of it, but it wasn't. It wasn't too massive a transition, no. And then you move on to Delight, back to Delight, to yeah. become a high school social studies teacher. Yeah. Teaching, learning how to teach, and actually teaching is, I assume, a big difference. Sure. How did you get used to, or how did you start teaching? How did you find your momentum? Well, it just takes practice. And again, the job that I had at the Nordic Track, mm -hmm. you know, as a training specialist, uh, I got to do a lot of teaching. Yeah in that job so I got better there um, when you get into teaching it just takes practice the more you do it the better anything right any right. type of skill that you do if you practice it and do it more so initially your first year or two you're still learning how to make it interesting how to write mm -hmm. good tests how to make sure the students are learning everything that all is, I mean you did it you learned how to do it in yeah. university right yeah but that's all kind of book knowledge mm -hmm. and you do you get a little bit of practice with your student teaching, but ultimately it comes down to... And then really what's really important for teachers is actually um, finding a good mentor teacher. If you're a young teacher and you see a teacher who's teaching really well, yeah. who knows how to make it engaging, connects with the students, then you need to, you need to go in and watch them. Yes. And you need to sit down and spend time with them and say, well, how do you design your curriculum? How do you, you know, and, and learn from them? That's probably the best way to become a, a good teacher. History in high school is a vast subject. And for the AP course itself, they me you memorize 15,000 years of history to give on one <laughs> test. Yeah. Do you have any advice that you could give to students that are taking such vast courses? Sure. Uh, and this is for university as well. It's not so much for high school. A couple different things with university. One is that you need to have a good calendar, right? right? Because you can't, you can't truly, and here's what's really important. Um, and in university, hopefully it switches a little bit, right? So that in high school, a lot of your learning is what we would call extrinsic learning. Mm. You're doing it because the teacher makes you. Yeah. You don't really, you don't really, you know, you don't really care about what you're learning. You know, you need to learn it, mm -hmm. but it's so you can get a good grade because your parents want you to do well in school, right? right? Yeah. So it's all about people on the outside. In fact, I'm not sure how many would come to school if it was optional. Yeah. Right? If we just said, "Ah, come if you want," I don't know how many Dalat students <laughs> would actually show up, or they wouldn't necessarily show up on time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so. That's all extrinsic. You're being kind of told to do it and, and there's all these rules and your parents are making you go to school yes. and you gotta get good grades. Intrinsic learning is what you, you, you learn because you want to learn, you yes. wanna care. And hopefully, it doesn't happen for everybody, right? But hopefully when you're in university, you switch from extrinsic learning to intrinsic learning. Mm -hmm. Like you switch from, I'm learning this because I'm being made to go to school to this is what I wanna do with my life or this is what I wanna learn about. So, you know, switching over to intrinsic learning. So when you're in the classes that you want to learn and you care about, and that's your drive, then it's not about just memorizing for a test, yeah. right? So if, if that's your motivation, I really want to learn this, you, you know, a lot, of, a lot of students can actually pass a test, you know, get an A in the class mm -hmm. and not learn a lot, yes. right? Because they just learn enough to you know, get an A on the test the yes. next day, but a week later, it's gone. Because yep. they didn't learn it. They just yeah. crammed it. They, you know, they did it all night or they studied all night. If you truly care about it and you want to learn, you got to do it more. You can't just do cram sessions and try to pass the test. Mm -hmm. So you need to get a good calendar. Yes. And a calendar is one where you're saying, okay, I need to, by the end of this, I need to be done with this. And, and also another good thing is to create a new, uh, your, your system of learning. Right? Everyone has a system of learning. Um, create some type of review. Yes. Right? So e even if it's just a habit that when you wake up in the morning, you spend 15 minutes reviewing this class or your notes. Because until you start reviewing it and you see something, I think it, what is it? I think you need to see something like six or seven times mm -hmm. for it to move from temporary to permanent, you know, right? Um, so if you really, and so like, let's just say AP World History, 15,000 yeah. years. Yes. Right? There's two ways you can do it. If you really want to learn what happened and you care and you're passionate, well, then you, you try to figure out a way to review and throughout, right? Yes. If you're a little bit more about just the grade, okay, you can wait till the end. That's not a good system. No. So with that much, with that much to learn, 
set up a calendar, set up something where at the end, every Friday morning you wake up, you know, 20 minutes early or whatever, or before you go to bed or whatever, you do something where you're going through your notes from the last unit. Yes. Something like that. Um, anyways, that was long-winded answer. <laughs> to their, yeah, if you really want to learn it, you'll study different than if you're just trying to pass a test. I can definitely relate. Memorizing <laughs> 74 vocab Spanish words the day before the test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, how, and how many of those 74 do you know <laughs> about 48 yeah, hours later? Yeah. It drops down, it drops down, and then, you know, and actually, jokingly, a lot of times, you know, you'll talk to people, and then, what did you learn in Spanish in high school? And they'll be like, oh, nothing. Yes. Right? <laughs> or French. Merci beaucoup. Okay, that's all I remember. Yeah. Or, or how to order something at a restaurant. That's right. Like, so after working as a high school teacher, you eventually make it, you become a principal, and then you become the head of school. How did you get the opportunity to become the head of school of the lot? <laughs> okay, well that's a little bit of a long story. I actually was teaching, and we were actually living in Brazil. I was mm -hmm. teaching at an international school in Brazil. And actually from there I shifted from being a teacher to a technology coordinator. So I was actually working, I was still teaching, but I was working with the technology and teaching technology courses. At, uh, after being there for five years, the high school principal position opened up here, and I had actually been planning to move towards and look at getting into leadership yes. after being a tech coordinator. And so the head of school at the lot was someone I had worked with before. Mm -hmm. So I, I applied and you know for the position and fortunately Delat said yeah and so they hired me in two thousand and one to be the high school principal. Yes. So for the next four years I was the high school principal, but in two thousand and five, the head of school had to leave abruptly in July. Mm -hmm. Right, had to go back to I think Canada, and as the high school principal I was what was referred to as also the deputy head of school. Right. Yeah. And so when the head of school can't fulfill their role, the deputy head has to yeah. take it over. So actually what happened is I moved out of the head of the principal's position and I became the head of school for that year. And I actually had only planned to do that for a year. I was planning to go back to being the high school principal after the year. I really wasn't planning nor had I really ever wanted to be necessarily a head of school. Yeah. Um, but about halfway through the year, the school board came and asked me if I would consider being the head of school. Mm -hmm. um, initially, I actually said no. Oh. They came back about a month later and said, would you reconsider? Um, so my wife and I you know, thought about it and prayed about it, and we decided that I would go ahead and let my name stand for the head of school position. That was in 2005, and that's the position I've been in. Earlier you mentioned you were looking to move from a teaching role to a leadership role. Sure. What prompted the change of roles? Well, you know, I love teaching. Now, one of the things I didn't want to do, and it's actually why initially I said no to head of school at lot when I was high school principal, was I didn't want to stop being involved in teaching with students. So, for example, even though I'm the head of school, I've, I keep teaching. And yeah. I've taught every year. Um, and coaching, and, and that's because I think if you really truly wanted to get into education, the reason you wanted to get into education was to be in the lives of students and to teach and mm -hmm. to be around them, right? Um, I had been teaching for a while, and I just thought it might be something. I've had a few people who had come to me at different times and said, You should consider moving into leadership for different reasons. Uh, they were just being somewhat complimentary and saying, Think about it, consider it, and so. Um, I don't know if I would have necessarily moved into leadership except for the fact that there was a leadership position at the lot mm -hmm. and I've been here before as a teacher and as a student yeah. and uh, you know I loved the school and I thought it was an amazing community to be a part of and I thought if I was going to try to be a principal or be in leadership this would be the best place. Yeah. I honestly don't know if I would have moved into being a principal if it hadn't been an opportunity to come back and try it here. Right, yeah. Um, so having a chance to become the principal and do that, then again, like I said, initially it's one of the reasons I said no to head of school is because I, I felt like the principal position was a good enough fit and the head of school position was just one more position away from students. Yeah. I didn't really yeah. want to do that. So, um, But it is what it is. 
Transitioning from being a teacher to a leader is a massive transition. Yeah. What were some challenges and h- how did you overcome them? Uh, I think the hardest thing about leadership is that uh, leadership is... I mean, there's two ways of leadership. Leadership is, you can, you can be the leader who, I'm the leader because, uh, I, you know, you have no choice. Either you have, to, you have to work for me or you're in the army and I'm your sergeant yep. or whatever. There's that kind of leadership. If you're, if you're truly in leadership for the right reasons, ultimately leadership is about just wanting to serve and help other people be the best they can be, right? Yeah. Um, So, you know, and and there's two things to leadership, I think. One is taking care of the people who work for you. So, you know, caring about them, wanting them to succeed, and helping them succeed. The other part of leadership is decision making. Someone needs to decide, is this okay or is this not okay? Is this person in trouble? Is this not, you know, there, there still has to be decision making. But you put those two together. And so... Teaching is is very much about engaging the students, making it interesting, making sure that they're learning. Um, leadership is, there's some similarities there uh, with those three, but it is very, very different. And it just takes time. Yes. Um, you know, as a first year leader, there's just so much to learn about leadership. And most of the learning is about learning to work with people mm-hmm. because, you know, if you're, if you to be a good leader, you, people need to want to follow your yes. leadership. And um, the only way you're going to have people want to follow your leadership is if you are in relationship with them and you care about them and you take care of them. And, you tr- and, and so um, you have to invest in people, but that's hard. That's yes. not easy, right? So. Truly great insight on leadership, especially I'm interested to go in that field. So oh, okay, yeah, yeah I, I think one of the most important uh, one of the most important characteristics of being a good leader is being self aware. Yes, being someone who um, who understands that you can make mistakes, understands that uh, sometimes you need to say you're sorry. That sometimes you uh, sometimes you have to make tough decisions um, and take and take the blame for things so that other people don't. Yes. Um, so I, I think one of the probably another quality I would throw out, which I'm I am constantly working on, is that a, I think a really good leader is someone who has humility, because if you are humble in it, then you're always a learner. You're always like I can be a better leader. I, I can learn from this. I, I understand that I'm not always right. That sometimes I have to understand that sometimes I'm wrong or that I've made mistakes. Um, so if you come in and you're teachable and you have humility, uh, it doesn't matter where you start as a leader, you're going to end well as a leader. Yeah. Right? As long as you have those things, you will eventually get to the point where you're going to become a good leader because those three things help you become the, a good leader. Yes. Uh, start to ramble. <laughs> With so much experience of learning in the lot, working at the lot, you've seen the school environment change to what it is today. What are some key changes that have you noticed, and were they for the better? Sure. Um, I mean, the lot's much bigger than when when I arrived. When I arrived in two thousand one, we were about two hundred students. Now we're about seven hundred students. Yeah. So. There's a lot of positives. That, are there some negatives to that? I wouldn't say they're negatives, but when you're a much smaller school, your community is much tighter. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you're a school of 200, almost everybody knows everybody. Yeah. When you're a school of 700, that's too big. So you lose a little bit of community, but then I think it's really important, you know, at lot, we keep trying to create that community. It's been really hard with COVID, mm-hmm. obviously, to have community, but pre-COVID, I think you could see that Delat was always trying to figure out a way to create community because within community, I think, is the most powerful opportunity for education because when kids are here and they know that, that their teachers care about them and they have friends, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that's, is that a little bit harder at a school of 700? Yeah, it's a little bit harder to be a tight-knit community when you're so big. Mm-hmm. But along with uh, the size comes diversity, 
you know, and opportunities. You know, we've our campus has gotten our facilities have changed really dramatically. Yeah. Um, we got better resources. So are we a better school? Yeah, we're a much better school um, than we were, you know, a, as as a school of two hundred. So yeah, there's been a lot of transition. That's definitely yeah, change. With this change that you've seen, and with 25 years of experience in education, do you have any general advices for students that can be applied? Uh, well, okay, I'm going to go back to that extrinsic mm -hmm. versus intrinsic. The reality is, is that there's, uh, you're going if you, if you want to get to the stuff that you want to do, you still have to do stuff you don't want to do. Yeah. Right? So if you want to be, uh, if you want a certain career, you may not necessarily want to be a writer, but you got to learn how to write well, no matter what your career is. So you got to learn how to, you know, and you got to memorize. If, if you wanna, if you wanna work in a Spanish-speaking country, you got to memorize <laughs> yeah. the Spanish words. So there is learning that's just for learn. You got to learn it. It's not necessarily you know you're passionate about it so you have to have the self-discipline to learn stuff that you don't really care about I don't mean that you know what I mean yep. like you still you the caring is not so much that I care about that subject it's just that I need to do well so that I can be good at this subject so I need to learn right well I need those so there's that learning and you got to be good at that you got to go to class yeah right in university you're gonna take some courses that you don't really care about mm -hmm. not even in your major you still got to go to class, yes. and you still got to study, and you still got to write the papers. Um, but the intrinsic learning, where you really care, where you're really passionate about, that's where you want to find. That's what you want to find. You want to find something that, uh, when you start studying it, it's not because I'm being made to study it. It's because mm -hmm. I really want to learn it. And when that happens, then it stops being work. Right. It yeah. stops being hard. Uh, I wouldn't say it's necessarily fun. It's still, it's still challenging, but now you care about it. So, um, you know, general advice to students would be, you know, you got to self-discipline yourself through the stuff that's not necessarily fun or in your passion or in your wheelhouse, but, uh, yeah, fi but pursue and find what you care about, and then really in engage in that. Yes. Be, you know, um, do what you need to do to be able to put yourself in those positions where you can be inside of that. And I know there's a lot out there that says, you know, follow your passion mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And you have to be careful with that. Um, I don't think it's all just about your passion. There has to be also that sense of, well, I want to do this, but there's all these things that are not necessarily passionate about, mm -hmm. but I still need to do them. So I think that would be one of those. And then university is... Um, is a fun time. Enjoy it. Challenge yourself. Yes. Try to try to pursue. And you could I could even say that for high school. You don't get as much choice in high school as you do in university, mm -hmm. but you still get choice, and you can still you know pursue and yes. engage. So I don't know if that's good advice. Or not, but. That's definitely good advice. I can see <laughs> where I could apply it in my aspects of my life. Okay. Sure. Professional career aside, what are your hobbies? What do you do in your free time nowadays? Uh, most of my focus right now is not getting old. <laughs> uh, it means I need to eat healthier because there was a time in my life where it didn't matter what I ate. Yeah. You know, my body could take it. Um, but now I'm at that age where if I don't take care of my body, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna come back to haunt me later. Yes. So I wouldn't necessarily call them ho hobbies, but I'm definitely more involved in eating better, which I'm also more involved in fitness. So I'm trying to figure out ways to stay in shape. So I started riding because I have uh, I have some arthritis in my knees, mm -hmm. but I still care about sports. So I follow certain sports teams, right. you know, Tottenham Spurs, <laughs> right, and uh, American football. I have a team, and NBA I have a team. So I either watch those games, uh, things like that. Um, yeah, those would be kind of again my hobbies tend to be towards fitness and yeah. athletic stuff. Having a demanding job like being the head of school, how do you maintain work-life balance so you have enough time to spend with family? <laughs> There's no such thing. No. Um, well, it comes back to that, you know, you got to have the discipline, right? Mm -hmm. So when my kids were younger, 
Um, it often meant that I got up before my way before my kids did, so f- you know, five o'clock in the morning, five thirty in the morning, so that I could do my work, so that when they got up, I could focus on them. Um, so uh, it comes to it comes down to self discipline. Yeah. Honestly, it, it comes down to you know I said a student should buy a calendar or have a calendar. Yes, yes. It, you know, it's about saying okay. I'm going to turn off the work at 5 o'clock, you know, so that I can be with my family. But at 9 o'clock, I'm not ready for the next day. I don't have my class ready yeah. or whatever. i got to get back to work, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, I don't know, work-life balance. And there are seasons in your life when your kids are younger, really small. There's not a lot of work-life balance. Life outbalances your work because you're yeah. always taking care of your kids. You're feeding them, changing them, you know. Doing bath time before bed, all that kind of stuff. Well, that's not your whole life. You know, they become independent, and then you have a little more free time. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but I think this is yeah, yeah, just self discipline of you know turning off work so that you can focus on your family yes. and your life or your hobbies or things, right. but also knowing hey, I got responsibilities, I got to get stuff done, so it might mean that. I have to get up earlier, I have to work a little later to get it done. Right. Okay. With over 25 years of experience and 17 years of being head of school, we know that now you're moving on to other places. Yep. Where are you, what are your future plans? <laughs> well, I just, I didn't know until actually a couple weeks ago. Oh. So if you'd asked me this last uh, semester, I would have said, well, I'm just looking. Mm-hmm. Um, so I looked to see if there was a position all over the world. We looked at different schools, different positions. I wasn't necessarily feeling like I needed to be ahead of school at another school. I was looking at maybe even going back and just teaching. But uh, ultimately, what uh, opened up was a head of school position at a private school, actually, where my family is from oh, in the yeah. United States. So a couple weeks ago, I accepted the head of school position at a place called New Life Academy in the Twin Cities in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, which is kind of fun because my two of my kids are in the Twin Cities, oh, wow. and my wife's parents are there, and my dad's a couple hours away, mm. so it's going to be a chance to be near family again. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to continue to be a head of school. You have a close history with this school, and you grew it from 200 students to now 700 and something. Yeah. What do you see? your legacy that you're leaving behind in the <laughs> What's my legacy? Uh, I don't know. You know, one of the things that's interesting about it is in life, when when you move on, where you're at, you know, there's there's all the, fr- the phrase of, you know, you're on the stage, but then when you're off the stage, the play keeps going. So, um, you know, within a, within a year or two, uh, a lot will be, a, you know, will have moved on. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, my, you know, my legacy, I, don't, I, I, I had the opportunity to help grow this school, so some of my legacy is just being a part of that. Yeah. Not necessarily that this, I have a legacy, I just got to be a part of the school and changing, so that, if you want to call it a legacy, I would say that's it. So. With all your experience and your time basically being alive, if you had a time to go back in any point of your life to relive any moment, what would it be? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, does it have to be one or could it be like ten? It has to be one. It has to yeah. be one? Because, man, if you had ten, I could go wedding day and, you know, birth of my kids. Those would be three right there. Um, wow. That's go back and relive one day. Well, I have jokingly said, so I'll, I'll go with this. I have jokingly said to a few people that I would love to go back, I would love to go back in history and find the first day that, and it was probably somewhere in my late 20s, early 30s, where I looked at something to eat and I asked myself the question, is it worth the calories? <laughs> So, and I don't know what day that happened, but somewhere in my 30s, because prior to that, if it was in front of me, I didn't care. If if I wanted to eat it, I just ate it. And there was a day, 
I don't know, maybe 32 to 30, somewhere in there where I had, I, I literally said, and I would love to mark that day because that, that, that people don't realize how big of a day that is. <laughs> right. that there's, there's a before and there's an after. And before that, it's I can eat whatever I want. It doesn't matter how many calories. I can just, if it's, if it's literally ice cream with whipped cream with <laughs> syrup all over it and nuts, it could be a 10,000 calorie meal and you never even right. cared. You never thought about it. And then something happens on that day when you think it, and then from that point on, you're always going, well, is it worth the count? So it would be fun to go back in history and find that day right. and acknowledge it and then make that an important day, like have a celebration <laughs> or, or, have a, or, or more like a funeral. You know, it's like we're, we're black or something like that. Right. I don't know. So I don't know if that's a good answer. But that's what I'm going to go with. It's a different, interesting answer. It's a definitely. different answer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is the last question that I ask every guest on my show. Okay. How much of your success would you attribute to luck, and how much of your success would you attribute to hard work? Hard work creates luck, mm-hmm. and you can't control the luck. Yeah. But I think there's a phrase out there that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's the idea that. Uh, the harder you work, the luckier you are. Mm-hmm. And so definitely some aspects of my life are just luck. They just happen to fall into place, yeah. right? And I had no real control over that. But it generally what I've seen of the world is that people who are willing to be disciplined, work harder, you know, those things, they seem to have more opportunities yes. that show up. So I, I'm going to give you a... My answer is... a is both it's mm-hmm. not one or the other yeah it's it's um i i was lucky but i think some of the luck came from work um and i've had i've had both right. yeah thank you so much for your time your story was truly inspirational <laughs> from taking a trip around the world to becoming the head of school of the lot yeah thank you so much for your time it was fun thanks a lot <laughs>